Now I'm asking questions. So here, as fans of video violence, video violence too, and captains, we'd like to know if you were inspired by any DIY SID films in the 80s. What inspired you to get out there and to be your own film which has become iconic? It has been said that probably Love Feast, but no, I wasn't inspired by anything. Uh, I ran a video store, and I, the only shot on video one at the time was Gourmet Chef from Hell. Gourmet, <laughs> Gourmet Chef from Hell, but I don't think I even watched it. Uh, we just decided that we wanted to. In those days, shot on video, you could either make a horn or you could make horror. And uh, we couldn't get the people to be in the porn. <laughs> so we made the horror. That's it. I wasn't inspired by anything. And I really hadn't seen any commercial or business films to let out there. It's the end of that question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mary. Yes. And how you can you tell everybody a little bit about what the industry was like back then when you sold your film, how it worked? Okay. Uh, you had a store, a little bit about, uh, a lot of people here never walk into a video store, I heard you say. Really? You don't remember video stores? Yeah. Some people do. Yeah. So, <laughs> in a video store, anybody who walked into the video store only wanted the movies that were released on Tuesday, with the exception of the people who liked horror films. And horror films. And what? Porn. And porn. That's it. They were released on Tuesdays. So, you could have a backlog of horror films where you couldn't have a backlog of any titles. So, when we made video bonds, we shot it on three quarter inch humatic tape. It was a big, a big tape. And we edited it at Comcast. We did. We did it at midnight at Comcast until they found out that there was violence and nudity in it. All this is true. So, when we finally had the film, we sent it to anybody who you can read the the, the adequate address on the back of a box. Um, so that was United and Vestron and Gorgon. Um, and Vestron and Camp both came back and said they were represented. Camp said they'd make a poster and put us in magazines. So we went with Camp. That's the honest and God truth. We had no idea anybody was going to buy it. We just sent this thing out. Uh, we hadn't even registered it with, it with Congress, you know, we didn't copyright it. But Cam in California came back and said, we will make a poster for you, and we'll put you in a little magazine. So we went with that. What was the, the budget for the film? I think those pneumatic tapes cost about $30. We probably had about 10 of them. So I'd say 300 bucks. <laughs> I actually was a theater actor and director. <laughs> but here's what happened. This is, a, this is a story. This is why the movie got made. A woman came into the video store with a uh, little tiny child and a little boy by her hand. And she brought I Dismember Mama up to the counter. And she said, is there any nudity in it? And I thought about it and I said, well, I don't know if there's nudity in it, but there's dismemberment and beheadings and gouging and guts flying. I got angry and she said, well, that's okay as long as there's no nudity in it. And I got very, very angry. I felt like Lenny Bruce. I really got pissed off at her, and that's what made me write the script. Uh -huh. It was a parody on stupid people who think that nudity isn't okay, but violence is okay. Right. So that's that's how it started. So it's neither the chicken nor the egg. To answer your question. <laughs>
Yeah. How, how did the sequel come about? The sequel came about because the two killers, right over there, Robin's one, Howard and Eloy, uh, said, why don't you make something that features us? <laughs> they really kind of suggested it. And they were so outrageous, and Pam said, yeah, we'll, we'll release a, a sequel if you make it, if you have another 300 dollars. <laughs> because we yeah. shot it on SVHS. So it was actually cheaper. Those tapes were probably only 12 bucks. <laughs> so it came about to feature Howard and Eli. And Howard went off to California and has written several reasonably famous sitcoms. And Eli still picks up roadkill for the parts department. <laughs> in Edison, New Jersey. He's a male. <laughs> 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 Anything else? So you didn't like, you didn't have like an like an initial like fascination with horror or like Oh no, I did love horror. Yeah. My my job was as an actor and a director, and that's what I went to school for, but I always loved horror film. I had the first couple issues of famous monsters yeah. of film I had. The video store was more filled with horror. That's probably why I didn't have business. I didn't stop the game titles. You know, I had like 17 racks of classic horror films. You had the same, I had a video store that was just like that. Yes, this whole back room was poor on one side. The back room was poor, but the front room was horror. You were writing and doing on your own. Gary, where are those tapes today? We want the collectors want to know. Where are the tapes? You know what you do when you went out of business? You you put them all in a bin and you sold them all. That's really what you did. I, I think I kept I dismember model because that is but um I can you, you you know you're so depressed when Blockbuster knocked us out. We just sold all the Acquired the rights to video violence, and then you know when you not too long after that made Captain's video violence too. Was there any sort of mainstream awareness of you as a director and these horror films that you're putting out, or would you say that actually there's a greater awareness now? Absolutely, I'm shocked at the awareness now. <laughs> Two emails from people who are writing books about 80s horror and are featuring video violence in them. Um, and I don't know if you know where we're in a book about famous VHS artwork. We're like the seventh page in, and we're in a book, an, uh, kind of an intelligent book about horror called Killing for Culture, and we're mentioned in that. And in the past, what we were in was video hacked. Now we're all kind of stuff. It took, uh, what, 30 years to be an overnight success. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Only 30 years ago. So we're raising money for video violence, the musical. Gary's email address before he takes off tonight. By the way, I do have a website dedicated to video violence. Um, I'm, we have a Facebook dedicated to video violence. And I don't think anybody's following my tweets on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm Paige, I'm with Camp Motion Pictures, and uh, just to give you the, the, the story in a nutshell, the Reader's Digest version, um, we are actually not affiliated with the original Camp video, uh, though we do have a conversation going on in a relationship with several people who were affiliated with that company, which then went defunct. So this was uh, the creation of this new brand several years ago by Michael Rasso, who also owned Pop Cinema and Seduction Cinema and Independent Entertainment and a number of other labels, was out of love and homage for these DIY SOB films. And I've been working with Mike and his company, so it's Media Labels, for about seven years. And when he came to me and said, I want to start a retro 80s collection of these DIY SOB films, about four years ago, I said, you must be fucking kidding me. And you really need to sell me on this, because I don't know what you're talking about. So at that point, he began this impassioned pitch, and he had had a relationship with Gary for a long time after his original uh, you know, tour with Camp Video and uh, some of the rights holders for Beauty Queen Butcher and Cannibal Camp Out and Witch of Her Massacre and the other titles that were released. And I actually sat down and I watched the films and I said, you're right, this is fantastic stuff. So that was sort of the genesis. There were a lot of different factors combined. And then, you know, we were a little bit ahead of the curve when we started releasing these on DVD a handful of years ago. It took a while for, I think, the people who were really into this type, this subgenre, and this era to realize that we were putting the product out there. And then through you know awareness and a rapport and attending the horror festivals and conventions, we realized that if we were to put out this, what we thought was going to be a labor of love that no one would pay any attention to, which was the VHS DVD collection, and it just so turned out that it's been our most popular release in the past two years. So,